this week on Arts Insight, in search of the frightening and beautiful. I see myself as a nomad. I don't have a home in the traditional sense. My bike is my home. A city's transformation. The culture evolves as the city evolves and we grow. It took us a while, but we found out who we are and now we're creating it. Blow up art with something that people already think of as a toy makes it so much more fun and enjoyable. And designs on one-of-a-kind dresses. From my perspective, it's wearable art in that there is so much that goes into a garment. I'm Ernie Manoos, and it's time to get arts in sight. Welcome to Arts Insight. We're at the Silos at Sawyer Yard in the Washington Avenue Arts District, one of the most vibrant and up-and-coming hubs for local artists. In a little bit, we're going to check out their massive new art wall. But first, inside the journey of a devoted traveler. Since 2013, one woman has ridden more than 38,000 miles on her motorcycle, crossing international borders, taking in new cultures, and often leaving a little something behind. I see myself as a nomad. I don't have a home in the traditional sense. My bike is my home. When I ride, the physical act is incredibly liberating, especially for somebody like me who grew up thinking that it wasn't possible for me to, to do this. I've traveled a total of 38,000 miles, roughly, and I've traveled through 15 different countries. So that's the United States all the way down through Central America to Argentina. The motorcycle is physically a part of my own body, and I'm slicing through space fluidly. And I'll meet people, I'll see things on the landscape that fascinate me. I'm taking photographs, I'm taking memories, experiences, conversations. I see this as an act of exchange. So when I move through space, I leave a trail of myself behind. I'd always wanted to ride, but I never thought I could because of my size, because I'm very small. I'm only about 100 pounds, and I'm 5'3", which is, uh, you know, uh, a physical challenge. Um, but I became really fascinated with the act of zipping through traffic and the feel of the landscape as I pass through it. And it, it um, basically steamrolled into this whole way of life. My goal is to take as many experiences that I encounter out into the world and filter them into new work. I work in a pretty large range of different media. I've been working on my project called In Search of the Frightening and Beautiful for roughly three years. The motorcycle parts that I use are a reference to the body, you know, back to that idea of being one with the machine, you know, when you're riding it. Uh, the motorcycle parts are, they become almost akin to internal organs. What the carburetor does is it takes, it takes oxygen and, and gasoline and, and mixes them together, not unlike the heart, mixes blood and oxygen and pumps it through the rest of the body. And the front wheel in this exhibition is repeated throughout the show. It's the first part of the motorcycle that meets the terrain and that guides you through it. But it will also uh, throw you on the ground in a second violently if you don't know what you're doing. When I'm on the road, the central act that ties all of this stuff together for me is the creation of hand-embroidered works that I place out in the landscape for people to find and keep. Sometimes people respond to those. I leave contact information with each piece so that people can get more information about my project. It's an entrance into new cultures for me on a personal level. I literally am a part of, of the world that I pass through. I have every intention of continuing around the rest of the world. My next trip ideally would uh, take me into Alaska and I would ship the motorcycle across the Pacific to Japan and ride 
around China, through Russia, down through Southeast Asia, ending in New Zealand. That's my fantasy next trip. I spent much of my adult life trying to grow roots and fighting that, and I learned that, um, in fact, it makes me very happy to stay on the move. So I see myself as um, someone who travels and learns and processes and makes. That is my way of life. Follow along on her quest at heatherljohnson.com. We're here at the silos at Sawyer Yard, and here it is, the new art wall. And to tell us all about it is the director of the Washington Avenue Arts District, Susanna Mitchell. Hello there. Hi, Ernie. Nice to see you. It's impressive. It, it is. It goes on and on. How long is this wall? The wall is just over 800 feet, and it was done by 14 artists, all from Houston, Texas. Okay, what's the idea behind it? Why do we have this art wall? Well, the idea is to create a space for artists to gather and the community also to have public space here in the midst of all of these working artists. And this is actually just the beginning of a much bigger project. That's right. You're standing in Art Alley, which will eventually become a plaza space for all of these buildings and all of these artists, as well as public programming. Uh, this is just phase one. There's also a landscaping phase and potential business add-on in here as well. And explain the whole area here, the district itself. So the district is home to what we believe to be the highest concentration of working artists in the nation. You're actually standing in the middle of three major studio complexes, each one with nearly 80 or more artists working. Wow, so how did you decide what should be on the wall? Well, we actually put out a call for entries to all artists working in Houston, whether you're a muralist or not, and we opened it up conceptually, so there was no constraint on what you could put on the wall. We had a selection committee that went through the over 90 applicants and picked our favorite 14. So there's 14 of them, 14 different artists? 14 different artists. Did you think about placement one after the other, or was we it sure kind of did. by chance? We, uh, we thought about placement, we thought about the colors, how they would go together, we thought about how much experience the artists had putting newer artists with sort of older veterans. and. Um, essentially thought about the entire flow of the wall. The premise was that all of the art would kind of meld together, either conceptually or color-wise, and create one long art piece. There's an event coming up here. Um, we're actually open every second Saturday of the month. Um, from 11 to 5, there's a public market in this space. It's artisans and food. And then the studios are open from noon to 5, so you can actually go inside of the buildings as well, visit with the artists, and see the art that they've been producing. But I was kind of hinting at Valentine's Day. That's right. On the second Saturday, just prior to Valentine's Day, the studios will be open and all of the jewelers will be featured. Thank you so much. You're welcome. A pleasure. Now, an Arizona painter reflects on his 15 years of living in Phoenix, exploring the ideas of old versus new in the city's ever-changing landscape. Art gives a place a soul. What better than to be walking down the street and see artwork instead of just a plain beige building? You know, life is better in color than in black and white. My name is Hugo Medina. I was born in La Paz, Bolivia. I uh, grew up in New York, and I've been living in Phoenix since 98. 15 years ago, I moved to Phoenix. I was uh, chasing my heart. There was always this stigma about Phoenix that I had no culture. Being from New York, when I first moved out here, it was hard to find. It was always there, it was just very hard to find. Because when I moved here, downtown, you went downtown after five o'clock and it was a ghost town. There was nobody around, nothing was open. People were walking in the streets and people were afraid to walk in the streets. And then you have the few activists, few people that believed in downtown Phoenix stayed there and fought the good fight to give it, a make it a destination, give it a place, give it a soul. So if you, artists usually go where it's cheap. They go in there, they start creating artwork. They start and then people will follow the artist because it gives a destination of soul. So they would go downtown to look at the murals. People use murals as backdrops for photo shoots. And the more people you have interacting, businesses are attracted to it. Because like, oh, there's people down there. We should open a restaurant. And the restaurant's starting opening up. And as restaurants starting opening up and retail start coming in, people are like, oh, we need places for people to live downtown. So now we have all these residences that are popping up. 
It's, it's a vital part of any economy, any downtown or any neighborhood. The arts brings people together. Murals are artwork for the people by the people. The murals and public art takes art that only a select few are privileged to seeing or can't see it and gives it to everybody to enjoy and be a part of. Uh, you can look at my murals and you can see the similarity between my mural work and my canvas work. The murals, even though um, they're more community based and they try to, I try to bring people together, which is what makes the mural special, is almost like um, getting everybody coming in for a cause that's bigger than ourselves and we come in and we leave something for everybody to experience and enjoy. The paintings for me are more of a diary of how I'm going through things, more personal. I start with an idea or a concept or even image and then I don't outline it, I don't draw it on the canvas, I just pick a spot and start from the center. Like all life evolves from the center, okay? And it works its way outwards. Uh, my paintings do that. I start from a certain location and I just let it grow and build. And it changes as it goes along. Uh, and I just keep building up to it and let the painting have its own life. I wanted to capture the changing face of Phoenix. And one of my goals was to have a show at Monarchit. One of the beautiful gallery downtown. And last year they gave me that opportunity. The whole series is questioning what is home. Uh, we have modernization we have old buildings new buildings I have paintings with new Phoenix and old Phoenix going against each other I started questioning all that and the series being a part of it started evolving with what is home like some of the paintings are of buildings that historic buildings that were here that got torn down at the James Madison Hotel historic building that's been part of Phoenix part of history got torn down for a parking lot so that's one of those paintings questioning the evolution of Phoenix, the change in hands. A lot of the paintings are of buildings that have been here for years, way before me, and some are new places that are here. I have a painting of a little coffee shop that opened downtown Phoenix, Jobot, where I go there and everybody knows my name. Is that home? Because it's they're all familiar. So, and then I started a new painting that I was born in Bolivia, so that's my home or birthplace and, and combining Bolivia and Phoenix and so it's playing with that theme. Culture in Phoenix has grown leaps and bounds in just the last 10 years, not even. Like we have amazing museums that are finally coming into light. Before you didn't know about it because nobody came downtown. Art moves people, it motivates them. It stirs emotions. So when you bring those elements into a neighborhood that doesn't have it, it gives it life. It's it's a amazing to watch it happen. The culture evolves as the city evolves and we grow. It took us a while, but we found out who we are and now we're creating it. What I love about Phoenix is it's almost like an empty canvas. You know, we have all these young artists and architects and engineers and entrepreneurs that could come here and make their own city. And that's what we're creating together. You can find out more by visiting hugosart.com. Up next, a team of artists from Rochester specialize in large-scale installations made entirely out of balloons. Their work is a combination of vibrant storytelling and eye-catching visual artistry. There are a number of things about balloons that I really enjoy. A balloon is a toy. And from the time we're little, we're taught that we can play with balloons. So to be able to create art with something that people already think of as a toy makes it so much more fun and enjoyable. And there's nothing sad about a balloon. You look at a balloon and you laugh, and, and you see the, the fun nature of it. Another piece about balloons that I love is just 
the temporary nature. You have something that's temporary, people look at it very differently. They don't, they don't look at it and say, oh, I'll come back and see it later. They want to take in everything they possibly can right now before it changes. We create large-scale installations, fine art and commercial illustrations, and stop-motion animations entirely out of balloons. What we specialize in is more of an experiential event rather than you know, a, an actual physical piece of artwork just because it does disappear at the end of it. It's amazing the amount of logistics that goes into a project like you know, the Aragami Balloon Adventure. We not only have to try and calculate how many balloons we might possibly use, but we have to figure out you know, how many crew members we're going to have, what are their skill sets, what do we think we can pull off in four days, and make sure that we have you know, just enough materials that you know, we're not going to run over and, and have you know, boxes left over of uninflated balloons, but we're not going to run out of things for them to do either. We'll come up with you know, some basic concepts of elements that we want to include in the piece with some pretty detailed engineering plans, but then there's lots of room for you know, our crew members to have some creativity and add elements where you know, they see a piece of the story that maybe isn't completely fleshed out. You know, they can add a piece. Without the input of everybody, it really would be not the same sculpture. The things we work on are so varied from the, the huge community building projects that involve you know, hundreds of people to the other end of it are the really tiny things that we do for ourselves. Um, the, the fine art illustrations that we do where it's just two of us in working off of a blank slate and creating original imaginative stuff, illustrating a kid's book. Art is this really, it's almost like a club that you need to, to belong to to understand certain types of art. Balloons are accessible. Balloons are something that people play with. So we work in a medium that allows people to play and enjoy and smile. We love that they take away from our art what they wish to, not what somebody has told them they need to. Check out aragami.com to see more. And finally tonight, an Ohio to New York, back to Ohio designer creates custom wedding gowns for all body types. Her creative process is based on the bride's personality, not trends. Fashion design wasn't my original goal. The sewing, I think, is what started it. It was creating something. I love to sew and I love to draw, and then found out that that could be a career. I had a mom who was very supportive of my artistic scribblings as a kid, and she always encouraged me to follow that talent, and she was instrumental in teaching me how to sew, although she said I surpassed her within a week. The entrepreneurial spirit came from my parents. They both had a business, and I grew up knowing that having your own business has its challenges, but I guess I just fell into that naturally. It wasn't so much fashion design as it was bridal design, and I found out that that's where my true love of design was because of the challenge of designing an all-white garment. My actual start in my career was moving to New York. My first design job was as an assistant to a bridal designer, and I paid my dues there. And my second job was as the lead designer 
I was 22 years old. I don't know what they were thinking, but they hired me. And my boss loved my last name, Van Leer. He thought it was very elegant. So he started using it in his advertising. I was there three years. And at that point, my sister had just graduated with her master's in business, and she also moved to New York. My business started because I had had enough with my boss one day, decided to quit. And I came home and announced to my sister, who had not yet found a job, I quit my job today. <laughs> and so we decided to start our own business. I would design 20 or 30 gowns per season, like for the spring season and for the fall season. And bridal retailers would come in and select from them. And eventually, my design was on the cover of Modern Bride magazine. We were interviewed by the bridal magazines every issue. So we stuck around. And we worked out of our showroom in New York, 7th Avenue, and went strong for a lot of years. The reason that I transitioned from New York to Ohio was the bridal industry was going through a difficult time. And I had to work longer hours in order to accomplish the same things at my end. I had two very small children. I hired a nanny to take care of my children so that I could work 14 hours a day and never see them. And one day I came home from work and my kids were being tucked into bed and I heard my daughter say, good night, mommy, to the nanny. And I said, that's it. That was the day that I said, I can't do this in New York anymore. The transition to Ohio is, this is where my roots are. And it was familiar and it made sense to me to come back and raise my children here. When I was back here in Ohio, I was working out of my home and I selected a handful of retailers that I wanted to continue to do business with. And I proposed that I design gowns specifically for their stores. Well, they loved it. Then my sister said, there's this really lovely bridal shop in Miamisburg, Ohio. You really ought to check it out. We offer many services, but mostly custom design. We also do alterations on gowns that have been purchased elsewhere. Fashion design is different, in my opinion, than custom design. The difference would be, I'm not just creating a garment that I'm trying to sell. I'm creating a garment for this specific person. And it's not just to fit her event, but to fit her style and her personality and her body. Now I design individually for each customer. And so there's really no theme or trend I'm following. I'm sitting down and talking with a person. I find out what kind of an event it's going to be and get an idea of their personality. And then I create something for them. I get a feel for her and her event and her vision. I'm thinking now of a bride. And then I take measurements. We look at fabric swatches and lace swatches. And then I make the pattern and make it what's called a muslin and the customer comes back for a fitting nothing fancy happening it's just to test the pattern make sure the garment is fitting well and is proportioned well and while she's planning her other wedding details I'm here sewing beads on and crystals on and finishing and then there's the final day the final fitting where she is here to put on her garment it's completely finished it can take a week or it can take months. It just depends on the customer's schedule. From my perspective, it's wearable art in that there is so much that goes into a garment from sketching it and creating it to make this customer happy and adding all the details that makes it specifically for that customer. Running a business in Dayton has been a lot more enjoyable in many ways than running the business in New York. My plan for my shop is to continue making fabulous dresses for the
the women of Dayton for whatever event they have. I mean, I would like to, to grow. I would like to have more opportunities to design unique garments. I guess my plans for the future are to keep on doing what I do because I love what I do. I have a wonderful referral base. So for me, I love having a small business in Dayton. I enjoyed the New York years, but this is the business I want. You can learn more at VanLeerBridles.com. And that does it for this edition of Arts Inside from Washington Avenue Arts District and inside the silos at Sawyer Yard. I'm Ernie Manoos. Thanks for watching. Have a great week. Bye-bye.